uh, I want to thank my friend John for that very generous introduction. So generous, in fact, that clearly the safest route for me is to simply say thank you, good afternoon, <laughs> and let you all go on to your next activity. Um, I, I want to also thank Greg Peterson uh, uh, of the Jackson Center and of Jamestown, who has invited me here. Um, uh, for his hospitality and for uh, introducing me to the Jackson Center, uh, showing me around uh, this morning a, a wonderful, wonderful uh, facility they have there and resource for this community. To give you a little bit of history on packing the court, uh, there is, as many of you know, there is no number nine in the Constitution. The founders didn't mandate that there should be nine Supreme Court justices. In fact, they didn't set a number at all. They believed that the court would need to expand as the nation expanded and as the business of the nation increased. Lord Bryce, who came in the 19th century and, and wrote a, a book on the American Commonwealth, said that in his words this was, quote, a weak point, a joint in the armor through which a weapon might someday penetrate. And Bryce knew that, in fact, that had happened before. And the size of the Supreme Court had gone up and down over the course of the 19th century. The court began at six. And John Adams, when the Federalists lost uh, the election in 19, uh, of 1800, John Adams and the Federalists promptly eliminated a Supreme Court seat pending the next retirement, just so that Thomas Jefferson wouldn't have the chance to appoint anybody anytime soon. This happened again in 1866 uh, under Andrew Johnson. And uh, seats had been added uh, to help Lincoln during the war. Uh, that court went up to 10. So it had gone up and down, and it had settled at 9 under Grant in 1869. And it, by 1937, it had been at 9 ever since. So it had a feeling of permanence. And Roosevelt, because he didn't want to be drawn into the issue before he was ready, didn't talk about it during the 36 campaign, didn't prepare the public for what he was thinking about doing. He crafted the plan in secret with Homer Cummings. And none of the inner circle knew about it at this point. Not Robert Jackson, not Stanley Reed, until it was quite too late. What they came up with was what Roosevelt and Cummings believed, believed was a very clever plan. And that was that you couldn't force the conservatives off the court, but what you could do was outnumber them. And so they came up with a device to say that for every justice, 70 or older, who refused to retire, the president would have the right to appoint a new justice to essentially sit beside the old justice and help him with his work. <laughs> they were very taken with the cleverness of this plan. And they didn't run it by any of their advisors, probably because they didn't want to be disabused of this notion that it was, in fact, very clever and would give Roosevelt six appointees overnight if none of the justices retired. They sort of reluctantly set a ceiling of 15 justices on the Supreme Court so it wouldn't go any higher than that. And so on February 5th, 1937, Roosevelt unveiled his plan to America. Not only to America, but he unveiled his plan in a series of very short meetings that morning to the leadership of Congress, to his own cabinet, and then he was wheeled into the Oval Office where he read it to the reporters. And it was a shock to everyone involved. And in fact, after he had brought in the congressional leadership, they got in their cars to go back to Capitol Hill feeling uh, very dejected um, by the notion that they were going to have to carry this through the Congress for Roosevelt. And the head of the, the chair of the, of the House Judiciary Committee turned to his colleagues and said, boys, here's where I cash my chips. He was done. He would not support it. He indicated this uh, on the ride back to Capitol Hill. And when they got there, and when the court packing message and the piece of legislation were read to the Senate, First, the, the rest of the Senate was hearing of this. John Nance Garner, the Vice President, who was effectively the Senate Majority Leader, he was so beloved on Capitol Hill, stood in the well of the Senate, held his nose, and gestured thumbs down. It was an incitement to revolution. And that is what Roosevelt got. There was huge momentum in the Congress to do something about the court. There was a lot of momentum for these constitutional amendments. There was a great desire to get the New Deal through and to do something about the court but not this. And they resented, frankly, that Roosevelt had not consulted them on this, had not sought their ideas, and now he was expecting them. He had actually drafted the legislation for them and expected them to carry it through. And so the plan, as one of Roosevelt's advisors later put it, began with a black eye. 
And the case that Roosevelt was making, the idea that this was all about judicial efficiency, that the court was behind on its work because these were old men after all, was an incomplete case, it was a misleading case, it was flat out untrue, and it was easily disproven by the Justice Department's own numbers. This happened within 24 hours of the unveiling of the plan. It was wholly discredited, and Roosevelt's motives in keeping this secret and in crafting this false rationale were called very much into question. No one bought the picture that Roosevelt had painted of congested court dockets and aged justices refusing to hear important cases, denying writs of certiorari in the language of the law. And in late February, Robert Jackson traveled to Jamestown, and he found FDR's natural supporters to be, in Jackson's words, baffled by the court plan. Roosevelt had not done enough to prepare them. He had not done enough to persuade them. And Jackson went back to Washington and wrote FDR a letter, giving him the, the sort of blunt, even harsh assessment that he was not getting from any of his other advisors. He wrote the president, quote, I have returned from some time among the plain people and regret to report to you that support for your court reform is decreasing. This, I think, is distinctly due to the terms in which the problem is approached. The general public do not know what certiorari is. They do not understand calendar, congestion. And Jackson urged Roosevelt to make the case more simply and clearly, and in his words, to seize the fighting issues. How the court had made itself a super legislature. How the conservative justices had gone out of their way to cut off every avenue for social and economic reform. How they were twisting the meaning of the Constitution. Jackson wrote FDR that the people are unquestionably ready to support you to the finish if they understand that this is the fight to make the court a contemporary and nonpartisan institution. I am utterly unable to get any response to the statistical approach, and I do not see that anyone else has. FDR had rejected this advice earlier when it counted the most, but after three weeks of being battered in the press, he was finally ready to embrace it. And in a White House meeting that followed with Jackson and Stanley Reed, he was surprisingly quick to yield and admitted, it is a pretty terrible platform to stand on, isn't it? He recognized that he had made a huge error in judgment. And so he resolved to do what he should have done from the start, which was to make the case plainly, to take the fight directly to the court, and to put the real issue before the American people. And said, Senator Wheeler, would you be interested in a letter from the Chief Justice commenting on the validity of uh, this plan? And Wheeler felt this was a gift from heaven and said, well, why, why yes, I would. And so Wheeler wrote a letter to Hughes asking for his views. Hughes then, over a weekend, produced uh, an incredibly powerful letter, taking apart this notion already discredited that the court was behind on its work. That was devastating to the court plan. But more devastating to the court plan was the fact that in the middle of this fight, in the spring of 1937, the court switched. Specifically, one justice switched, Owen Roberts, who was the justice in the middle. He's the justice I didn't mention because he didn't line up neatly with either the liberals or conservatives. He had, in fact, gone back and forth. But he had increasingly aligned himself during those New Deal cases, vehemently, in fact, with the conservatives. Most liberals thought that Roberts was lost. But here, in the spring of 1937, suddenly, Roberts votes to uphold a minimum wage act that was virtually identical in every respect to the one he had voted to knock down less than a year ago. And then a couple of weeks later, he joins with Hughes and the Liberals to uphold the Wagner Act, a sweeping piece of legislation. What a day, Robert Jackson wrote. The court was on the march. Roberts had yielded. He would always deny it, but he, had, he would always insist that his positions on the two minimum wage cases were actually consistent, even if the results were different. But no one believed him, and I would count myself in that crowd. This was the Constitutional Revolution of 1937 as it's known today. But really, it took some time for that revolution to be waged. And the court, which changed in that moment in 1937, was transformed by Roosevelt's appointees. I mentioned Jackson, Frankfurter, and Reed, also Hugo Black, who was the first of those appointees, and others. And in any event, this was a very costly victory for Roosevelt. Alan Brinkley, in his book, The End of Reform, cites this moment as the beginning of the end of reform.